Well, uh, New England's hidden histories, if you just take a very broad and basic uh, kind of definition of it, is the attempt and the project to digitize and preserve digitally church records in New England and uh, give scholarly accessibility to the church records so that people can see them. That is a really, really uh, skeletal definition of the project, however. Uh, it entails a great deal more. Uh, we, are, we are taking in and um, digitizing and transcribing records from the 17th century through approximately 1820, early national period. And uh, this is not just a set of vital statistics. It's not just births, deaths, marriages, although those are there. And they provide a lot of very good and helpful information but it is a much more multifaceted project than simply a record of who was there, how long they were there, and when they died. Well, and it, it strikes me that in addition to making these records available uh, to the public, you're also serving an important function in terms of simply preserving them, because okay. many of these are <clears throat> or have been in places where they were at risk to uh, various types of damage. Very much so. Some of them were even long forgotten by the places in which they were found. Some turned up almost uh, uh, serendipitous uh, events. Some were very tattered and even a little mold damaged. And it was clear that they just could not be stored in boxes in church basements. Uh, the project began a long time ago uh, as uh, a sort of avocation of Dr. Jeff Cooper, who was following the imprint, or could we even say the map, that was provided to him by Hal Worthley, mm. <clears throat> the original, um, well, really the source of this project, who had for his doctoral dissertation at Harvard uh, traced some 700 churches in New England to find out about what, you know, their early records. Uh, Jeff used that, uh, it's called the Worthley uh, itinerary, um, and he used that to go and follow through and actually go to the churches, get the records that they could. Some churches like to donate them for the reason of preservation. Some are a little more loath to part with them, so in that case they can loan them. But almost everyone who's interested in history is interested in preserving the history. So whether they retain the documents or they send them to the Congregational Library and Archives, there will be a digital record of these, uh, of the records. And that will last for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I seem to remember that really the first big notice for the project came uh, with a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that prompted a front page article in the New York Times. Uh, mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, that National Endowment for the Humanities has remained uh, a source of funding. Uh, I believe you're on your third grant from them now. Yes. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about other support that's been received and how you've reached out to different organizations as well? Yes. Uh, yes, as you say, the National Endowment for the Humanities has been a tremendous help, and we're so thankful that they found our project worthy to reinstate it now for the third time. Each grant is for a three-year period. Uh, another very important organization has been the Council on Library, uh, Library, oh my goodness, Research, <sighs> Council on Library, Information and Research. Right. Sorry, it's, uh, we always call it CLIR, C-L-I-R, mm -hmm. so I have to stop and think what it means. Um, they've been fantastic and very supportive also and very helpful financially for our project. In addition to that, of course, the ACA, the American Congregational Association, uh, cost shares with what uh, ends up being close to 50% of our budget. So they are extremely important in keeping us going and we're very grateful for their uh, support of the project as well. Um, then there are donors, certain individuals who find uh, reasons to make a donation. Some churches are happy to make a donation when we are going to preserve their records. It's not, it's not required, but some people do it. One, one 
one lady up in, I think it was New Hampshire or Vermont, just had sort of a, a bake sale and raised money uh, for us. So it comes from large and small uh, donations and grants, of course, are the mainstay. Yeah. And I, I might say that as a <clears throat> member of the Congregational Library Board and, and aware of some of the budgeting and so forth, uh, anyone who's watching who feels uh, interest in this uh, is, is free and encouraged to donate as well, because uh, this, this is such a vital and important project. Um, we've talked about church records. Could you expand a little bit on, on what types of records you have? You mentioned not just uh, vital statistics, birth, marriage, baptisms, and so forth, uh, but what other types of documents can one find if one goes on the web? They're organized on our website in three categories, the church records, personal documents, and church councils. But in between those crevices, there are all kinds of other things. So personal documents, for me, the most interesting aspect of the personal documents have been the conversion narratives. Um, I think that that was one of the major fines uh, that began this project was uh, in Rowley, Massachusetts, the find of a uh, previously unknown existence of 500 handwritten by individuals personal narratives uh, for people seeking church admission to the Congregational Church in Raleigh. And some of them are back to the 1600s. We have men, women, servants, African men and women, a Native American, at least one. Uh, and we have people who could write beautifully, mostly later, and people who were scratching out, and it's, it's just moving even to see how they did that. That in itself is beautiful to see the attempt they made, whether they could even spell or barely write. It's also interesting to note, especially as time went on, the editing by the clergy so that as we approached the Great Awakening period, people were more likely to be more expressive in their religious experience. I mean, the point of these conversion narratives is to show that they'd had an actual experience of accepting Christ as their savior that changed them and that made them eligible to join the church and receive communion. So as they talked about these experiences, they would sometimes go through a kind of standard pattern, but many times they broke out and, and said, you know, very emotional and moving things. And it's curious to look at the original documents to see, someone might say, and I was uh, inexpressibly moved by the sense that God was with me. And then someone will cross out inexpressibly moved. And I was, you know, I, they'll just tame mm -hmm. the language down a little bit. And, and that's okay because it's there to see. It's there to see both points of view. Um, there was a great interest in having um, uh, not too much enthusiasm, as we say, in that mm -hmm. time period. But nonetheless, because it's there, we can see it. We can see what the people were really feeling and how they expressed themselves. Uh, so that's something important. And, and I would like to point out that in one of our sets of conversion narratives from New Hampshire, the majority of them are written by women. And it is the largest repository of female autobiography so far mm -hmm. that we know of in existence. So we're hoping to do a lot with that as time goes on. Um, we also have letters, we have diaries, we have um, farmers records of planting and harvesting and oh dear, the horse died and having to, you know, go get another one. We have some uh, ministers, uh, many ministers records of their personal lives and in the way that they had to eke out a living in a barter society and uh, needed more firewood uh, to get through a winter and had to go to the church. Uh, then we have church councils so that when there were disputes, uh, councils were called and uh, different congregation leaders came together to debate an issue or decide on something. And then, of course, we have those very riveting accounts of disciplinary cases. Uh, confessions. Um, many, many times, many, many times, even in the, <clears throat> in the Sunday record, you will have a couple going forward who have, you know, their baby is born three months too soon and 
strappingly healthy, so they would have to go up there and repent of that. But they were received back into fellowship. It wasn't some kind of harsh. Mm -hmm. you know, we had the idea of they'd be of people being put in, you know, stocks and pillories and things, but right. it was quite. It was actually quite uh, merciful. Uh, what else do we have? We have oh. records of missionaries who were missionaries to the Native Americans. Uh, John Elliott, and we have uh, Gideon Hawley, and also records of the first, what we call a praying Indian church, uh, mm -hmm. which then was a mixed congregation in Natick, Massachusetts. So it's, it's just very varied. All right. Now, I guess at this point, um, you have a large amount of material that's been mm -hmm donated or went to the library, um, that ultimately has to be scanned to be put online. Yeah. And then hopefully it also gets transcribed uh, into a form that uh, visitors to the website who cannot read 17th century handwriting uh, are also able to uh, look at. Where, where do we stand on that? I mean, in terms of what percentage have been scanned? What percentage of those? Any rough ideas? I don't know that I can give you a percentage. There are so many records still, you know, in the queue right. to be done. We are required by the NEH grant to digitize 18,000 um, pages hmm. over the course of three years. And that's okay. not just photographing them. There's metadata and there are sure. many, many, you know, back backroom sort of things that have to be done for these records. Then when we, I and my team uh, get the digitized images, then I'm able to send them to the volunteers, sometimes in groups of 10, depending, and then they transcribe them. They also receive editorial guidelines and, uh, you know, problem areas, things that crop up frequently, directions. Right. And then they send them to me, I correct them, and uh, we, we are very careful to keep line lengths. Uh, we try to use verbatim uh, transcription so that, sure. you know, the, the superscripted letters are there and it's obvious what has been inserted and such things, which I think adds a lot of character. Right. And it also makes it much more interesting for scholars or students to just come mm -hmm. and be able to read it. Right. You mentioned how Worthley's inventory, and I, I knew how actually was at an NEH summer seminar with him many years ago in the mid 1970s. Uh, and I gather that that Howe's widow, Barbara, was has been one of the volunteers. I don't know if she's still doing it. Oh, uh, yes, she is. She's a how, wonderful volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. How do you gather the volunteers and, 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 and train them? Okay. Well, First of all, let me just say, Hal also was a volunteer, which I thought mm. was wonderful of him too. And before he passed, uh, he was he was working with us for a couple of years. And as you just said, Barbara has continued and she's very vital to our project and she's so thrilled to be doing it. So uh, I think it helps her and, and, and it certainly mm. helps us. For the others, what we have is there's a, a link or yeah, a link on the website that says, if you're interested in transcribing an 18th century document, it gives my contact information, gives a little minor description of what would be involved. And then the, <clears throat> the people contact me. Um, I send them a, a trial page or possibly two with all of the guidelines and all, and then they send it back. So if, if it looks like they're doing pretty well, then I send them a little more and hopefully they stay with us. So at this point, we have a, a core group of about 15 to 20, I would call them regulars. It doesn't sound like that much, but these these are extremely good uh, volunteer transcribers. So I can really rely on them. They know the ropes, they know what to do. But in addition to those, that core group, I often have people who come for a few months, they do it for a little while. Maybe it's somebody, a student in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a professor on sabbatical who just wants to keep his hands in it. And we have people from all walks of life, uh, everything from pastors, current pastors in churches, uh, genealogists, as I said, uh, students, professors, and 
history buffs, just people who are very interested in either their local history or history in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I know one of your volunteers, uh, Laurie Stokes, went from working on transcribing some of these to going and taking another look at the Thomas Shepard uh, narratives uh, yeah. from which she's recently published a book. Uh, yes, that's right. This. So, yeah. yeah. She's done a, a great deal of work also with the Cambridge Platform mm -hmm. and uh, several other articles. Um, right. um, and then we have um, prize-winning scholars such as Doug Winiarski, who mm -hmm. made his entire fantastic book called Darkness Falls on the Land of Light on the records from the Congregational Library right. and the Relations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before uh, the Natick Congregation. And can you tell the viewers a little bit about the new uh, search engine or, or search process that you have for identifying uh, Black and Indigenous records within the broader collection? There's a finding aid on the website mm -hmm. that will take them to anything that is the Black, Indigenous, People of Color uh, set of records that the staff at the library have put together. And I think it's a pretty simple way to follow that. I'm hoping that we'll be able to do something like that with a woman's women's initiative mm. and you know gather some things there because um, as everyone knows, most of the people most of the people who got the attention in these records were the men. they were the they were the heads of the households, they were the ministers. but the women, have amazing things that they have written and we and it's wonderful to see all of the various uh, contributions that they made. We have uh, diaries of women, we have uh, a recorded trial of a woman in Connecticut, it's in her words, her testimony. Uh, it was a very sad story of um, the family had lost three children in a row, I believe, and the father became very angry. And so it became a case of domestic abuse, actually, and she left him so that it became a church church trial. And um, yeah, so we have things like that. And we have uh, the wife, uh, well, we have the wife of a New Haven minister, Pierpont, Sarah Pierpont, who is the sister-in-law of Jonathan Edwards' yeah. wife. Yeah, so really, there's there's a lot there. That's good. Um, you've given some indications, but in, in general, how do you envision the process, the project moving forward? I think that having established the process now for this project has been going on for six full years, I think that we can continue honestly doing that always looking for more and more interesting things. Some of the um, documents that we have slated for NEH 3 are particularly interesting. Sermons from the era of the witchcraft years mm -hmm. from various preachers, uh, quite a few uh, formerly unpublished sermons of Cotton Mather um, and, and other things. I mean, that's, it's not only that era, but, but I would like to see it expanded beyond just the it's wonderful to have the volunteers, but I would like to open it up more so that more people are first aware of the project, that you don't have to be a history major or a professor or someone like that in order to uh, avail yourselves of this great project. Right. And I think we've had some really great experience where I was contacted by several university professors, one was in Mississippi, one was at the University of Connecticut, uh, who had their uh, undergraduate history students uh, do a section of our project. And then we had um, some classes at Harvard Extension uh, School under Bob Allison, who had his students, grad and undergrad students do this. Some of those students went on to teaching in even middle and high schools, and they had been so enamored of the whole process that they had even their students doing these. So of course I, I tailored the difficulty level for them. Sure. But the kids were absolutely excited about it, these yeah. primary source documents. So I would like to see some more of that. Mm -hmm. how, um, how much linkage do you envision between what, what you have and what might exist in 
other repositories uh, that would enable people to sort of move back and forth between these different uh, sources? Yes, we have quite a bit. Um, we will have that with the Massachusetts Historical Society. We presently have it with the Peabody Essex Museum in uh, Salem, uh, the American Antiquarian Society, uh, quite a number of uh, partner libraries and organizations because that's the advantage too for them. Mm -hmm. That it, it doesn't veer traffic, so to speak, only to our site, but is shared with them and they're able to have people come to their websites as well. well this is all fascinating. Is, is there anything else you would want to share with viewers about the project and uh, about the project, I guess, yeah. It's about the project. Um, I'm, of course, very enthusiastic about the project. Um, I find that the small details are riveting sometimes. They're, they're the things that never made it into a history book, but they show us the common everyday average problems and situations of men and women who are forgotten, hence even this name Hidden Histories, it's not just that the documents were hidden, but the lives of the people were hidden. So I like bringing that into light. Um, I well, What else did you want to know? What else do I enjoy about the project? Is that what you said? Well, you could talk about that or, or you know, just... Um, I, <laughs> I forget oh. what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I got off on a tangent, I think. Um, yeah. I, I would just really like to see other people who are not necessarily in the categories I've already mentioned, go on and take a look, look around. I, I think in start with your local community, see if your town is listed on our already transcribed records, or if even if they're digitized and not yet transcribed, you might be able to, to do that. Um, and if people are interested in participating, they can always contact me. We're always eager to have new volunteers um, we train you, we help you, you're not just left, oh my goodness, some, I think sometimes people think it might be a little easier than it seems from the, um, from the ad on the, on the website, and they might get a little intimidated. I try to ensure everyone, you're not alone, it's okay right. if you don't know all the words. It's just fun, and it's, it's yeah. good, yeah. And I would also like to say about our volunteers, I just can't praise them enough. I have rarely worked with so dedicated a group of people who not only do the work beautifully, but ask for more and are thankful to have it. And it just makes the whole thing flow very well. That's great. And I, and I imagine that if there's anyone who's watching this, uh, who knows of some records in their own New England parish that they have not been contacted about, they should get in touch with you because... Uh, the effort to find these things continues. It does. And if you know in your church that you've got somewhere on a shelf records that really you don't know what to do with, uh, you can contact us at the library. You can contact me. You can contact uh, and the executive director at the library. And you can talk about it with them. You don't necessarily have to part with them forever. Um, but you will be able to preserve them and you will see them come to daylight by our process of digitizing and transcribing.